This is a fun one. The adoption and the future of blockchain. I just threw these slides together real quick. Gonna roll. Just gonna wing it. This is a really important segment, though, that we're going to recycle over and over. So let's talk about the adoption, the future of blockchain, and uh, really how things actually diffuse and get adopted. Uh, this is a core concept video. It will be out there publicly because we're going to use it as a foundation, as a force multiplier to help explain a lot of other things that are going on. The first thing to know when you're thinking about the adoption of blockchain, how new things actually diffuse throughout all of history, is that better does not always win. Okay, better does not always win. There are uh, tribes in third world countries that won't give up their uh, axes made out of stone because it represents something to them other than like efficient work. Okay, so we have to realize that what is better in our minds based on well, our, our base knowledge does not necessarily mean better for somebody else. It might mean more efficient, but it might also violate their religious or cultural beliefs. So better, whatever we think is better technology or a better tool. It does not mean it's going to get adopted uh, by the masses. It doesn't mean other people think it's better. So a little bit of like perspective and awareness there. The more important thing is that innovation does not scale. It does not. And I, just hear me out here, okay? Because yes, of course, innovative things have become diffused, but not as innovation. Uh, innovation gets attention. Information gets adopted. Innovation does not get adopted. It does not. Uh, so if I, for example, if I was like, hey, I got a brand new car. Elon Musk gave me a car. Entirely uh, autonomous, self-driving. You want to see it? Everybody's probably going to want to see it. Like, no, it has no steering wheel, no gas pedal, no brake. Everybody wants to see innovation. They just want to be in awe of it. And if I said, hey, look, I'll sell it to you for a hundred bucks. It's worth way more than that. Um, but for a hundred bucks, if you drive it home right now, most people would say, hell no, I'm not going to let this car drive me home. It has no gas pedal. It has no brakes. It has no steering wheel, right? It's too innovative. So innovation gets attention. Information gets adopted. This confuses people because they think everybody wanting to see something is the equivalent of wanting to adopt it into their lives. And those are different things. Okay, so innovation gets the attention, information gets adopted. And uh, in order to really understand how this relates to the diffusion of all technology, we have to understand the difference between innovation and information. Okay, because the same thing can be both to different people. So to do that, we turn to Diffusion of Innovation, uh, uh, incredible social research. Highly recommend this book, Diffusion of Innovations, the fifth edition by Everett Rogers. It is very dense, uh, but I, I've probably read it five or six times now. It's totally worth going through over and over and over. It, it is the foundation of all modern marketing, and it is a roadmap for diffusing new ideas. It's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant book. Okay. So innovation... Let, let me go back to a story here or just an example. If I say, um, hey, you know, if you do this, 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 it'll lower your uh, your A1C however many points. Okay. That's data. <coughs> Excuse me. That's data. Now, a doctor could hear that and go, aha, that makes perfect sense because they have a base knowledge to understand that language and, and the implications. Whereas another person might go, what does that mean? And now they're more confused. So the distinction is that data is, is put out there. Technology is put out there. Uh, technical specs are put out there. White papers are put out there. People say things. Okay? If it widens the gap of uncertainty, if the person hearing it becomes more confused, it is innovation. If it closes the gap of uncertainty, so the person hearing it now understands better how to behave with that data, uh, it's information. So you see, innovation does not, uh, diffuse, does not get adopted. It diffuses when it becomes information, when this new thing can be observed and people can go, oh, I under, now I'm more certain about whatever problem I had. Uh, now it's information, it gets adopted. So it's not the innovation that gets adopted. It's what innovation turns into information. 
I want to talk about how that happens because it's it requires a lot of perspective and understanding, and you got to zoom out and and get some um, perspective on where the uh, the technology or the idea is. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, somebody says something. If it is if it confuses the audience, it's innovation. If it gives the audience more certainty or clarity, it's information. So the same person can say the same thing. And to one audience, it's innovation. To another, it's information. Hope that makes sense. So again, what is information to one party could be innovation to another. So we end up looking at the uh, adoption curve. This is diffusion of innovation, the adoption curve. And we've all seen versions of this. What happens is you get a bunch of innovator types, and they keep thinking that they're giving information. Right, but we educated. We put out these white papers. We did all these videos, uh, but by not understanding the base knowledge of the early adopters, they're actually creating innovation. They might even be polarizing people uh, because what they think is information is actually innovation, which is widening the gap of uncertainty. Right? Now, in technology, there's another. There's a newer uh, adoption of technology curve, which is. The exact same the data works out to be about the exact same except right here there's a chasm there's a big old chasm and that chasm is typically something like regulation because regulation brings clarity which drives down uncertainty okay so this is just all innovation uh, technology you're gonna see uh, if you google like adoption of technology or something you're gonna see a big gap here uh, and it's called the chasm and that chasm is typically going to be uh, uh, regulation or some regulatory effort that brings clarity. Okay, so <laughs> for blockchain, you get a whole bunch of people right here that understand it and believe in it, and they're just so angry at everybody else that they're not listening. But the reality is you're not providing information, you're providing innovation, uh, which is why we go to the Rocky Road. If you haven't seen the Rocky Road, I strongly recommend you go back to that video. It's in the foundations. Uh, you can go read the dissertation. It's a it's a uh, dissert Stanford student dissertation from 1990, and it explains how and why we get stuck at these chasms, and it's just because we don't fully understand the base knowledge that we're working from, uh, like unconscious competence, and we don't understand the base knowledge of the people we're talking to. So we keep thinking we're giving information, and we keep thinking that they heard the information, but we actually just confuse them. Okay. So understand that people have different base knowledges at each uh, uh, little tier here or each little uh, segment of the market. Uh, so there's different base knowledges. Generally speaking, innovators are going to be more educated. Uh, they're going to travel more. They're going to have a wider range of experience, so they're a little bit less dogmatic. Uh, they're typically more affluent so that they, 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 do, they can take bigger risks because they have the means to do so. They can invest in things they're a little uncertain about because, they again, they have the means to do so. So uh, they come from a different base knowledge than the early adopters and so on and so forth. Okay, Equally important is they put a different weight on credibility, a different weight on credibility, type of credibility. Okay. So early adopters bias competence credibility, whereas laggards bias safety credibility. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that way over here, you have some of the smartest people on the planet talking to some of the smartest people on the planet. I mean, they're creating new technologies, new medicines, new, all, you know, these, these brilliant humans. And uh, they don't really care if you're nice to them. They don't care if you're, you're friendly. They understand that they're competent enough to just understand the facts and the second, third, and subsequent order consequences, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so they bias competence, credibility. They can look at a white paper and go, wow, this makes sense. I get it. I'm in. Or they can look at another human and say, yeah, you know what? You are competent. You're kind of an a-hole, but I trust you. And, and that's how they make decisions based on competence, track record of competence, okay? Now, the rest of the world likes to think, you know, they do due diligence and stuff, but the research is very, very clear. As you move to the right, as you get later and later, it becomes more and more about safety credibility, right? The laggards, they don't care if somebody is competent. They don't care. 
they probably don't know how to read the white paper. What they want to look around, they want to look around and they want to see all their friends doing it so they know that it's safe. They want to see Oprah say that it's safe and Ellen DeGeneres say that it's safe and Dr. Phil say that it's safe. Right? So they, they uh, lend their credibility to safety. Another example is uh, it's in all the, the, if you read any books about how uh, hospitals are run and <laughs> the preferences of patients, when faced with uh, the option of like a brain surgeon with a 99% success rate, but he will not talk to you. He's kind of an a-hole like Dr. House, you know, he's kind of an a-hole. You will never see him. He'll do your surgery. He'll leave 99% success rate. Or this other surgeon who still does well, you know, 85% success rate, which is well above, you know, whatever standard, uh, but he's going to meet your family and he's going to talk to you and he's going to check up on you. Most people by a large margin want the less effective brain surgeon that is friendlier to them. Okay. That's safety credibility. That's just people wanting to know that somebody cares that they're okay and that's fine. But it's important that we understand that that's how people make decisions and that's how innovation gets turned into information. So if you're a innovator or an early adopter and you're talking to your family as an example, and you keep trying to shove stats down their throats, you got to realize they rocky road. Yeah, and if you've seen this, you'll know what I mean. You got to realize they're not looking for competence, credibility, they'll, they'll validate their decision later with competence, but people actually later on in the adoption curve, they actually adopt safety. Okay. Like, <laughs> and as you get further down, uh, the, the like uh, mass market, late majority laggards, they actually discredit competence. It's very strange, but again, it's in the data. Go read the book, go do your research if you need to. Um, the, the more competent and the wealthier the individual, the less they trust them. Okay. So this is like, uh, you know, nobody likes Dr. House because he's just, uh, he's just not a people person, but everybody trusts Dr. Phil, who's probably not a very good doctor at all, but he makes them feel safe. So you got to realize that the competence actually becomes less and less important in diffusion. Now, ho hopefully there's a base layer of competence, uh, but that's not what people are adopting. They're adopting safety. They're adopting their friends liking them and fitting in and all that stuff. So you really important to realize where we're at and also where you fall. Okay. If you are a late majority, if you like to wait until you feel safe and, and you see everybody doing it and yada, 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 then don't play in crypto right now. It's a mismatch. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just not aligning your, your strategies with your disposition. If you are not an innovator, then um, you got to realize that, it, you know, the volatility, all this stuff, all these people freaking out about all kinds of stuff going on in the world. A lot of it is they're just trying to be somebody that they're not. Okay. <laughs> so that that's a quick overview. I'm going to show you the adoption decisions, though, and talk a little bit about what what this might look like in the future. Um, just understand that it, it becomes first it's about competence right here okay, and as you go it becomes about safety the, the there's the same five adoption decisions but the innovators are looking at through the lens of competence and the laggards are looking entirely through the lens of safety same five decisions through a different lens okay, so laggards by a safety credibility so again as long as as long as uh it doesn't feel safe. Most of the market's not going to come in. Hey, right, so five adoption decisions, it's supposed to be plural, and one massive lever, just to give you something to look out for. So it help you, again, help you understand the path forward is very likely not what everybody thinks because very few of the mass market, early majority, late majority laggards that are in crypto right now or any technology have never actually experienced uh, technology this early before. So they're not used to this kind of bumpy road uh the five adoption decisions okay so we're looking at competence credibility to safety credibility uh, whichever end of the spectrum you land on this is how something turns from innovation into information so that it can get adopted by whichever you know whichever party it should be adopting it right now
One, relative advantage. This is simply asking, why would I do this over what I already do? Like, what is the advantage of using crypto over my bank account? Like, how big is that? I, I realize there, there might be an advantage, but is it really so much of an advantage that it's worth flipping my life upside down and learning all this new stuff? So the new thing has to be relatively better than the old thing, but it has to be better in the way that the audience values, right? So a lot of people go, well, this is better because self-custody and like most people don't even know about that. That's not a relative advantage to them. So when, when the relative advantage to them is obvious, it becomes information. Number two is compatibility. Is this compatible with my life, my religion, my espoused values, my, uh, you know, I got kids at home. Is this compatible with being a stay at home mom? Is this compatible with yada, 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 all the, all the other parts of my life? Does this fit in? Right. It's really important. Complexity. How difficult is this? You know, how much am I going to have to learn? How am I going to get overwhelmed? Yeah. So again, um, the complexity will look different based on the stage of the adoption. Like a, a lot of people that were first into crypto, as an example, it, the, the technical complexity wasn't a problem for them. Right. <laughs> and they could go to the white papers and figure it out because they bias competence. Later on in the adoption, we're actually going to be looking at safety complexities. Right? How hard is it to, to get it insured? How, what happens if I lose my money? How easy is it to reclaim it? Yada, yada, yada. Okay, so it's got to have a relative advantage. It's got to be compatible. It's got to have the appropriate amount of complexity for the, the wave of adoption. Trialability. Can I test drive it? Can I have a free account? Can I have a free, uh, you know, just so I can try it? Uh, that trialability alone, when you, aha, oh, I understand how this works now because I push the buttons with very little cost or risk. Uh, now it's information. So triability is a big one for turning innovation into information. Observability. Can I see it? Somebody is far more comfortable buying a Tesla when they've seen it around all the time. There's a ton of research on solar panels. Uh, solar panel, this is a great example. So a solar panel salesman goes into a neighborhood and tries as hard as he can to explain all the benefits. Here's all the technicals. Here's all the cost savings. Here's all the data. And most people say no. Okay, But one or two say yes because they're innovator. He comes back six months later, a year later. And ask them, hey, you know, I just got to check, are you still interested? And people go, yeah, 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 I want to buy it. Wait a minute. So uh, this this is how humans work. They go, oh, yeah, I don't understand solar panels. Uh, I don't understand the cost. I don't really know how they work. I don't really understand energy. And they say no. Then their neighbor gets one, and they see it for six months. That's observability. And then the salesman comes back and like, oh, yeah, I get it now. Yeah, I'm ready to buy. The truth is they don't understand solar panels any better. They don't act this. They don't understand any of it any better. What they had was the ability to observe it right across the street. Okay. So these are all the things that we do to ourselves where we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally, uh, you know, I understand this now. But you don't actually understand it now. You have safety credibility. So anytime like you drive a car, if you don't know how a car is built, um, then you bought it from safety credibility, All right? You just, we look around, this is how people get around. This is normal. I should get one too. That's safety credibility. You didn't study the technical documents and figure out exactly how the car works and why does it run on gasoline and, and how does this work and that's how some people do. Those are, those would be early adopters, you know? So it's really important to realize how people actually adopt stuff. Uh, so one, we can have reasonable expectations and two, we can kind of, modify our own behavior appropriately and then the biggest lever um biggest lever is how much reinvention has been allowed uh, so oftentimes we create something uh, i use the viagra as an example all the time uh <coughs> viagra was i believe a heart medicine first and then through trials they realized that it relieved headaches and then through more trials, they realized it did something else that people would pay a lot more money for. 
And so had the creators of Viagra, whatever it was called, you know, whatever its chemical name is or whatever. If they said, uh, no, 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 this is only for heart conditions. It would not have diffused the way that it did. So the big lever is really, yes, this is what blockchain was created for. And this is what the innovators want. The less it gets reinvented, the less likely it is to turn into what it can be, which means we want people to take it and use it in weird ways that nobody would ever think of. And the more weird ways, the more it gets reinvented, the more ways people discover to use this, uh, the higher the probability that it gets diffused. Okay, so if you get super dogmatic about, no, blockchain is supposed to be this, you are a huge limit to the actual adoption. You have decided that for whatever you learned at this time, you've extrapolated out and decided that is the only and best use for everybody. And that's one, like, kind of sociopathic to think that you know what is best for everybody forever. Uh, but two, it's a huge limit to, uh, to adoption. Okay, so <laughs> hopefully this is helpful. This is a really broad overview. I've done much longer videos, much deeper dive, uh, but you just understand how these things work. Okay, the best technology is not always adopted. Uh, the keyboard that we use, ASDF, is the first, uh, you know, the, across the left, the first keys. This keyboard is arranged this way because typewriters used to jam. Let me see if I can find the right slide. Uh, typewriters used to jam. Okay, so they rearranged the keyboard to be mathematically as inefficient as possible. And then there was more innovation, and then we got computers and desktops and laptops and all this stuff. And uh, right now, the keyboard we use is mathematically arranged to be as inefficient as possible. Now, there's something called the Dvorak keyboard, which was mathematically arranged to be as efficient as possible. Do you have a Dvorak keyboard? You probably not, not if your keys are ASDF. Uh, because once something is adopted, and now you say, everybody learns how to type. All these typing programs, people can type very fast. We say, what's the relative advantage? Like, do I really need to go from 300 words a minute to 400 words a minute? Is it really worth relearning how to type? What is the compatibility? I mean, that's fine. You know, what's complexity? Well, it, even though it's more efficient, it should be pretty simple. It's pretty complex learning a new thing. Uh, <coughs> could I try it? Can you mail me a Dvorak keyboard? Uh, can you find a friend that has one? Observability, you would need people around you to be using the keyboard and getting better results, and you would need to see that for a long time. So the better tech did not, on paper, the better, more efficient tech did not get adopted. That happens all the time, right? So just be aware, these are all the kind of the factors. The future of blockchain, I think, looks very, very different than what people think. I've got a little bit of a glimpse at it, you know, uh, Polygon Studios, uh, Horizon.io, and their sequence wallet tech. They're good business people, they understand mass market, and they are addressing relative advantage, com compatibility, complexity, trialability, observability, and their technology also allows uh, for a tremendous amount of reinvention while still settling on the blockchain. Okay, so I'll share more, but just give you an overview of diffusion of innovation, and uh, you just realize we're like here, and there's a chasm, probably regulation, um, but shoving it down people's throats using your base knowledge is not going to help. We got to go back and say, okay, um, what's the relative advantage? Not to us, but to them. What's the compatibility? How do we make it less complex? Can we drive down the complexity for them, which like the sequence wallet is doing great. Uh, trialability, observability, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as per usual, I don't have a slide, but share your uh, six word update and and you guys, if you guys want to talk about it, we can fire up a uh, conversation with the community. This will be a recurring topic, which is why I had to make this video. Appreciate y'all.